Okay, a big hello and welcome to this special webinar called Bright Minds that is being initiated by the Times of India and Comviva. My name is Pankaj Doval and I'm the national editor at the Times of India. As you know, Comviva is an Indian company that simplifies business complexities. Its solutions have been deployed by over 130 communication service providers and financial institutions in more than 90 countries and have delivered the benefits of digital mobility to billions of people around the world. Through Bright Mind series, we aim to empower the workforce of tomorrow by making them aware of various innovations and opportunities in technology and fintech related sectors. Our goal is to inspire and equip students and professionals alike with the insights, skills and perspectives needed to excel in a rapidly evolving world. Through this partnership between the Times of India and Comviva, we seek to create a forum where industry leaders, experts and aspiring talents can come together, exchange ideas and collectively shape a brighter future. The topic of today's webinar is AI, Automation and the Future of Work. And before I begin, let me introduce my panel. I have Mr. Manuranjan Mohapatra, better known as Mao. He is the CEO of Comviva and one of the most dynamic professionals in the Indian tech and telecom industry. I have Dr. Saranjit Singh. He is the Vice Chancellor of KIIT or the Kalinga Institute of Industrial Technology. He has been an experienced academician who has, who has, who has to his credit three books in the field of material processing technologies. And I also have uh, with me Mr. Anand Kumar. He is the Chief Information Officer uh, Digital at Bharti Airtel. Anand has a rich experience of nearly two decades in the IT and telecom sector. And uh, before uh, before I start, you know, I'll make a reference to a recent uh, interview that uh, Elon Musk had given to uh, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, where when he was being asked about AI, and the future of you know AI when you talk uh, when you also link it with generative AI, uh, he was asked about jobs and uh, Musk said that you know in the future there may be well there may be no jobs at all it may they may not be required at all. So with this kind of a context, uh, let me take opening comments from all the panelists. That what do you what how do they look at AI and generative AI? What is the impact that it can have on the industry and their opening comments? So let me let me start with Mao. Uh, Mao, how do you see this uh, statement, and how do you see the overall scenario right now? Um, interesting topic. Thanks for uh, um, all the panelists being here. Um, Pankaj, the point is uh, more uh, symbolic that the current set of jobs we are doing it it will not be required. Like there'll be nothing called programming. I mean, the, the machines will program for you. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, there'll be nobody required. No human mind would be required. There'll be a shift that will happen. We have seen multiple generations of transformation. When industrial transformation happened, everybody thought, uh, the, let's say, the uh, when the, the, the rail locomotive came in, that the, the, the road transportation is going to come to an end. And we've seen it only expanded because of the hub and spoke uh, need. Same is yeah. true about it. It will just be shifting. And the question is more pertinent to say, are we ready for that transformation for that shifting? Um, I have no doubt in my mind that uh, the need would grow. In terms of? Uh, total number of people who need to do the job in the AI uh, era. Yeah, right. right. Thanks. Uh, Anant, what are your, your opening views on this? I kind of echo the same sentiment. Um, so what is happening is even in the era of generative AI, where you have virtual assistants now coming into play, yeah. you have to be a lot of jobs traditionally, which humans are doing right now, which may become obsolete, right? But it will be definitely doing repurpose. So even in generative AI, you need prompt engineering. So there's a new stream which has already come up as we see. And like all new technologies, when they come, right, there is news avenues that open up. Right. And therefore, the reskilling of the manpower and the resources will be required and there will be shift in jobs. New jobs will keep on, uh, will get created. I think it's just a shifting of workforce that will happen. Right, right. And uh, Professor Singh, uh, how do you look at this scenario, especially because you're dealing with so many youngsters who may be kind of worried or maybe they find this as, you know, a big opportunity for them. How do you see this scenario, uh, your opening comments on this? First of all, thank you, Pankaj, for inviting for inviting me and KIT for this panel, and thank you, Mao sir, for considering KIT. Uh, our honourable founder was been invited in the first instance, but 
uh, he looked into the topic and then he came back he said sharanjit it is you all got to talk uh, i am a social entrepreneur uh, maybe you can request pankaj next time if anything in that line we will speak so uh, he is excused because of that so coming back to what you said pankaj i'll uh, agree with what uh, mr manoranjan mahapatra ji and mr anand kumar ji has said uh, we have been uh, last 15 years uh, i have been very closely working with the students with respect to industry engagements career opportunities placements and every year i touch base to close to 7000 to 8000 students at least in my university along with my team and that has been my uh, uh, you can say uh, one of our uh, performance areas of course uh, there has been lot of reports which has come to the market like gartner and so on and so on which talks about diminishing of certain kinds of job roles and probably advent of certain new kinds of job roles yeah. of if you, if you see those reports net net if you see there will be of course you will find a decrement in number of jobs that is for sure uh, i don't know the new tech which will come up the futuristic tech which will come up will add or may compensate this losses which may happen but there net net if you see the new roles yeah. getting created let's say for ai ml and what is the job scenario coming in next 5 years 10 years and what probably the jobs they will eat away so net net is a deficit right now but i'm sure there are new things which will come up i can give some analogy from educational background from where we come in yeah. see with the ai tools coming into picture now yeah. uh, the university's life us is now been challenged and plagued with how to manage the plagiarism coming in big way now uh, when i go <laughs> i tell you sir this is a fact and students are so smart they they are now using the the, the latest version of chat gpts and all different kinds of ai tools and then they create those yeah. project reports do those yeah. assignments and are submitting now this is a trend which we are seeing post covid era in a big way now when i go back to my drawing hall and connect with my senior teachers especially they say that no 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 this cannot be done because the plaque says that it is having more than 20 30% of uh, uh plaque actually now the thing is i mean whether we should run away from the tech or we should embrace the tech so i have been now from last 3 months has taken the charge as a vice chancellor have been going back and encouraging all of them that you have to actually embrace the tech and this is how the things will be and there will be more things which will be getting unveiled now we are bringing a subject call how to do technical writing using ai tools and how to do the prompt engineering which anand has said right now okay. and this will be a part of curriculum what change we have brought pankaj is that what we are saying is that don't give marks is or the mark scheme should not be based on the quality of the report which is been submitted let you give entire 100% marks on the viva vosa exam which you will conduct on that so what i am saying is that Absolutely. let student who has been generating this data putting in the report form should also undergo it mandatory and let the faculty also undergo that same high quality report and frame questions based on that so the my overall learning curve actually right. goes up this so is the I mean. procedures also change yeah. but now uh, what kind of impact do you see uh, on the industry because of this generative ai over the next you know mid to long term like 5 to 10 years uh, what what kind of disruptions do you see what kind of impact do you see because your company has been in the business of you know providing smart business solutions and uh, how do you see things changing uh you know that's something which is uh, though we are talking about change the change i strongly believe is going to be gradual it's not going to be a, a electrical switch one fine day somebody comes and switches now what is really happening is one is visualization is improving and improving by the day personalization is one area that will explode and you know we were whether i go to a shop whether i do a online buying digital is going to play a key role but today we get certain level of personalization the segmentation that happens is broadly you know the society is divided in three or four or five segments based on age or demographics or economic standard or whatever you can get down to truly any equal to one every individual the data usage behavior everything is known and you now personalize whether it is in healthcare whether it is in edu tech um like you know i didn't know this i learned uh, very recently the uh, the ceo of gmsc the the guys who conduct gmat uh, he he was my ex colleague at uh, kamiva he told me that uh, 
the questions that are thrown at a student when he's writing gmat is uh not the same for everybody so depending on the degree of difficulty you are dealing with that is how successfully you are answering a difficult question the next question that is thrown to you is of a different degree of difficulty and so so effectively what is happening is even edutech is getting personalized uh examination and evaluation is getting personalized i have a friend in uh, purdue university i said that hey this statement of purpose that you ask for students to write for our admissions now they are being left right center generated by gen ai why are you asking this unnecessarily he says but now we have learned how to evaluate it we can we are not evaluating the content of a gen ai output but we are evaluating uh, has the student it's almost like a open book exam and all of us know it is more difficult than than a closed book exam so i think the question that you're seeing in 5 to 10 years we will get a very different personalized world which is very high on visualization and and uh the way it is presented to us the way we get options and the way we make our choices healthcare retail telecom any any segment doesn't really matter you don't think that there'll be any sector that will be left untouched uh because uh, you oh, no absolutely when when ai phenomena whether it is generative ai or in in general ai ml started everybody thought it to be an adjunct even we in product development organizations we created another group called ai but then suddenly we realized that ai is uh, pretty much embedded in every aspect of what we do yeah and and it is intrinsic to our day to day activities and ai is in hr ai is in finance ai is in supply chain ai is in uh, it ai is in uh, technology ai is and then you suddenly realize that it is not ai ai anymore it is a very fundamental way of thinking and that's the transformation that it will take one or two generations i mean i'm assuming one generation is about 8 to 10 years in you know it context it it would take 10 years to change but it will change right uh, anand the telecom industry has seen a lot of you know i mean to say upgradations of the last uh, decade or so how do you see the what kind of changes do you see in the telecom sector because of ai generative ai you mentioned personalization is that the only area or there could be a lot of new things which are coming in the telecom sector as well no i think um, we are now looking at everything that we do and how ai is going to help us improve this and i can give you an example um, if we want to deploy a network site Yeah. at some location right um there is obviously a cost involved and we want to know how if we can recover the money will we'll get people and therefore this choice of where we should deploy the site becomes really important yeah and today it is based on human intelligence uh, on the field knowledge it is increasingly now being deployed using artificial intelligence where we try to data mine a lot of information across the data points that we have uh, customer mm-hmm. banks competition data uh demand sectors and then we are able to deploy the site it has started giving us better results right in yeah. not only this in terms of network maintenance equipment maintenance as well we are now moving into predictive maintenance is oh, reactive is long gone now it's all about predictive and self field even before the customer knows there's a problem we know it and we are able to solve it uh, that's one area yeah in telecom as you know is also you know a lot of uh, is also highly prone to uh, regulation comes really important here yeah and therefore not only fraud detection prevention in terms of security yeah i see a lot of uh, artificial intelligence tools and technologies being deployed now so experience is just the starting point it is those use cases are easier for us to implement but yeah. we are now experimenting with generative ai in all these areas right 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 and dr singh uh, you know technology is changing so rapidly so how do you ensure that your curriculum also stays up to date with the needs of the industry and you know with the technological changes which are happening across the world very apt question uh, pankaj we 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 are blessed that we have leaders like mao and uh, i'll cite one example uh, which has come from comiva itself so uh, yeah. here comiva came forward and they chose few institution across india where they said okay can we think of doing some left shifts 
and uh, the institutions need to be ready to adapt those left shifts so what yeah. we did was we sat together some of our professors some of the subject matter experts from comviva and uh, we co-designed and co-created few curriculum and this curriculum was in the area of of course something pertaining to the partner for sure but at the same time is something which is not been taught in the uh, universities like us because it has a lot of industry flavor into it so it yes. was cloud and ai ml and 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 likewise for telecommunication which was been designed and right. it has also been co delivered so when i say co delivered so the, the the modules of this syllabus was been discussed at length and wherever there has been a competency that competency was delivered internally and wherever it was yeah. required that we should go for train the trainer kind of and stuff we exposed yeah. our faculty member and they got trained and then Right. some of those use cases and some of those live cases were brought in from the partner from the company so all this has been happening in a big way and right. yeah in per se uh, pankaj i'll say we have been very very aggressive with respect to working closely with industry and last 7 8 years we have been almost working very closely with some 20 25 corporates where yeah. we have co designed and co developed not only one subject maybe a battery of subjects and courses which actually comes in the form of specialization and it comes and fit it inside the curriculum so it is like working very closely with industry understanding their problem statements their areas where they require to pump in the fresh legs and then bringing that competency as a left shift back here so in this case university need to have that freedom good that aict and ugc of the world has been now giving that flexibility in the form of nep 2020 but it's always been a challenge pankaj because because see there are so many things to do so what i'll suggest let's say if any university who will be actually looking into this video you have to figure out or the university has to figure out which are the key areas they would like to create an impact which are the key areas they would like to actually have their competency getting built up it is not only for delivering a particular course and making students ready but it is also linked with the kind of r&d the research the consultancies and the publications the intellectual properties which the university is going to work so if they align that uh, come forward that these are the three four areas probably in that then they can work out some collaboration programs with corporate and corporate is coming forward this is a trend which has been very much now there in india and that is the way we move forward no but how uh, uh, proactive i mean say how receptive is the ugc to such kind of you know initiatives that you guys take because at the end of the day as a student people would the students would also like the courses that they are doing to be you know recognized in some uh, some form or the other because you know uh, you may be doing a good job in getting the industry involved but those courses need to be uh, you know as per a framework and then you know whatever they do those programs need to be recognized by someone so that you know the, they can show that in their resumes or you know when they are applying somewhere so last 5 years have been a very very good run pankaj in that sense and i'll 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 I'll, I'll congratulate all the I mean uh, people who are the helm of affairs with Ministry of Education, uh, uh, because AICT, UGC, or, or maybe Bar Council of India or Medical Council of India or Dental Council of India, they have been all been under that purview, and all of them have opened up. There have been lot yeah. of best practices. Yes, there is lot of best practices which they have brought in in the system. Yeah. If you look into even the NAP framework, so yeah. now you have a provisions where you can bring in those electives. Now. Yeah. the thing is the option or the flexibility has already been given now but then whether the flexibility can be created an option one internally we brainstorm and we create those battery of electives and give it to students option two i go back to person like mao saying sir sir i want your help and this are an areas probably we would like to collaborate can we co design it and then probably you can help us also to teach to some extent and then the baton can be transferred to the faculty members and maybe after 3 years probably we can think of some other tech some other technology coming in and some other battery of electives so these are the things which institution at the side has to explore and implement but there is now complete freedom as far as yes bringing experiential learning as far as the concern as yeah. by it is uh, this question is for uh, mao and anant and you know uh, maybe anant you can uh, speak first and then mao i just wanted to know that when we talk about so much of personalization what is the role of this you know uh, data protection because at the end of the day the dpdp bill is also there that applies both to individuals and corporates and uh, when you talk about personalizing any kind of experience for the users or for a corporate I- i'm sure you need to take special consent for that because you know you may you may be doing a good thing from your perspective but there may be you know somebody with 
come and tell you that why are you analyzing my data and why are you doing this it could be an individual it could be a corporate so anand if yeah. we start with you like you know yeah yeah so full on this aspect that's a very very relevant topic and um, uh, like you know that atel is also going to be a large data fiduciary because we collect a lot of customers right. kyc information and right. it is required for us to give him service as per the law right, right. so obviously there is this consent mechanism which is going to come up and if we are using any machine learning on yeah. top of customers data on how he uses our services it is primarily to improve those services but if a customer wants us to remove that uh, he says he wants to remove that consent and we are right now figuring out how do we remove customers learning from the model yeah. itself so if i use a generative ai model and it has been trained on some insights about customers trend buying behavior what happens if similar customers are buying same things it's mostly anonymized not personalized to a customer but it is a learning so we're moving that learning also from the model is what we are right now evaluating oh, really you remove yeah. the learning so we have to retrain the model moving the customers data we train the model right so it's the fine tuning of the model that we have to start doing uh, because that is where the privacy concerns might come in yeah yeah right? how do we scrub the customers data how do we make sure it is anonymized it is not um, accidentally leaked to let's say a call center executive yeah who is supposed to see that information so all those things are getting considered and secondly what information we have to keep which is only relevant for the service so sometimes we collect data which may not be relevant to give that service so how do we remove that information uh, from our ecosystem all these things are getting into place now because of this data privacy bill Right. And now, uh, how are things changing at your front? Um, I think Anand said it right. This is a huge challenge in front of all of us, and uh, we are trying to leverage technology to beat uh, the the vulnerabilities created by technology. Like uh, you know, we use in some of our financial systems blockchain to yeah. protect to protect the data. Now, can we for sure you know? cross our heart and say that we are completely sure that it will never be breached hopefully not and till it is next breached and then we find an answer to plug it yeah. uh, and that is how the the evolution happens it's like uh, uh, any other area we are both in uh, fintech space and uh, we serve telecom i can tell you that there is a bigger challenge in fintech that in telecom because the how you deal with credit card how do you deal with the the bfsi kyc um, yeah also a lot about their financial transactions and all that people are far more sensitive if you know you called somebody past midnight is is may not be acceptable but if you know what did you do with your financial transaction is a bigger crime so so i think the point here is that uh, it's lagging it is definitely evolving and meeting some of the basic needs whether it is Uh, predictive analysis to say that hey this is potential fraudulent transaction and we need to plug it or this has uh, a possibility of a breach uh, but end of the day you can only program the system a learning system to what you know uh, for it to learn it will learn from the the behavior uh, the way the transaction happens over a period of time and uh, hopefully uh, the system will stay ahead of uh, the frauds uh, but but your point is valid this is definitely one of the emerging challenges but there is an associated one i'll tell you yeah. you know there are biases in data itself so the data that you feed into a ai engine if that is yeah. biased the ai engine outcome is going to be biased so how do you remove those biases uh automatically is is even a equal challenge and and maybe anand can comment on it but at this point of time that's an area that we are focused on to see if we can find some answers yeah but, i think uh, you are very really true i think i just like to add on to it a little bit saying it's there's a known problem in open source generative ai models about hallucination uh you know and this is one of the prime concerns because if you want to bring it mainstream into our business we need to tackle this issue Because it can lead to ethical concerns as well. So yeah. very true. Yeah, and the thing that's that's one area of concern in terms of how do we make this perfect for the customers. 
can you explain this uh, thing of hallucination that you mentioned because there will be a lot of students and also other experts listening to this what do you mean by hallucination so it's like saying if you are talking to a generative ai they start giving you random responses which are not factual right yeah. but they are generated because it has been it is it is basically a large language model right so it bases the language it starts generating responses right which may not be factually correct and that's hallucination so it is a error in correlation and when you correlate that anand typically wears a green sweater and combs his hair in a certain fashion you create a persona and then you say anybody who matches this persona um you know can be clubbed into a aggregated group that behaves in a certain way and that is definitely uh, it's prone to error because it has picked up generic data and that's what he's saying hallucination because not every behavior will always match yeah Right. They start deviating from the actual facts, then more derived facts which are not correct, and that's yeah. where the problem lies. Well, Doctor Singh, when you hear things like you know the kind of comments that these guys are giving, don't sometimes you get scared that you know maybe your students are not prepared for this kind of complexity when they are going to the industry. Is it a scary scenario, or do you think that you know they'll have to now go to the industry and learn uh, along with the job? of course uh, i agree uh, pankaj i mean there are a lot of things which uh, a student will learn within the university campus but the actual learning uh, the immersive learning actually happens when they work on the real time projects and which is the business projects at the industry at the corporate but yeah. i i I'll, i'll put it in this frame i mean uh, uh, i mean the fear psychosis is more on uh, uh, people at a higher generation people like us i tell you i had a recent experience yeah Where to yeah where we wanted to develop a small lab and this was with regard to one of a company which is a us based company and we wanted our students to undergo a 3 months training yeah this company is completely into a uh, 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 share market and they were actually into hnis and other uh, high net worth uh, individuals as well uh, with a very very uh, some uh, you can say precious data which they have yeah. now the problem was uh, even when we devoted and developed a lab suddenly from the singapore office one mail comes in and they ask us that what if if there is a data leakage what if if there is a uh, conflict of interest with the students who are actually still as an intern because they have yet not graduated and become the employee and they are getting trained in your facility of course by the company's subject matter experts and then i didn't had an answer and then you see how it worked out we actually went into general insurance and you won't imagine the kind of uh, money we both co partners came in and we pumped in to just to save the data to in the form of insurance we did we knew probably in a, a very seculated culture like within a university oh. which is just a training we will not have those mishaps happening but you can just imagine we just went into 5 cr kind of an investment only for data protection for the 3 oh. months of training which has happened And but ransomware is uh, ransomware cyber theft is real and especially you know areas like ransomware cyber threats are big area now yes and and the ceo of india i mean he has to struggle again going back to the drawing board and uh, i mean going back to their even board and impressing them that okay it is doable and we can still do it it, it actually the entire project went on to hold right 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 I said I want to tell you for for yeah. the benefit of everybody but more so for Professor Ranjit sir um you know I run a small organization 3000 odd employees I have been in this industry for more than uh, 35 years whenever in the beginning of the year we plan fresher induction into the teams there is always a rush for give me more freshers than give me more lateral hires people who are five year experience in the industry that means they had graduated five years back are less preferred than freshers because there is something the academia is doing right their ability to learn their ability to observe and they're more what i call the t competencies they have one or two vertical depth but a lot of horizontal depth that you lack five years back correct so so uh, professor sadgit please keep doing it you will always be in safe thank you thank you so much sir. that's that's very good to hear uh, we spoke about uh, data privacy 
but uh, let's also talk about you know the issue of ethical considerations you know uh, that it some things uh, make very you know some some solutions are you know very good for the industry makes things easy but maybe ethically they may not be right uh, how do you tackle this issue uh, if i start with anand that you know uh, this ethical considerations in the use of gen ai uh whether proper p- procedures were followed whether proper consent was taken or maybe you're buying a proper software uh, you know how do you look into all these issues so in so what we have today is that uh, we normally are heavily regulated right so any kind of customer complaint becomes really important for us in terms of use uh, and therefore whenever we are giving any service to the customer right the data is never shared to any third party or anything right it is always within to improve the service experience right so that's one and if and any personal information of the customer is always via consent right so if we want to use as a show him an ad right that ad would be served by airtel not by any third party the information that airtel has right would be available only within airtel to give a relevant uh, offering because i know the customer and i know how is he experiences my product tomorrow the data privacy bill coming in if the customer wants us to revoke those access as well as to remove his anonymized advertising id it is possible right so we are already in that concern area and another kind of uh, ethics that comes into picture is about KYC, right? So if I go to a retailer, sometimes there are frauds that happen. And how do I ensure that there is no fraud happening with my customers? Right? Nobody is misusing the documents which are being collected. Yeah. And therefore, this large uh, fraud detection piece, which is based on again AI, on to detect fraudsters, which may yeah. be my employees, could be my retailers, could be anyone in the ecosystem. Right? Yeah. So we take a lot of concern on this, and this is how we are tackling this. So as a as any mobile customer in the country, you know one of the things that I think telecom companies should actually tackle is this menace of pesky calls uh, and uh, you know so many of these unsolicited messages. You know this is something where I hope technology is deployed very soon, yeah. so that you know uh, it. I, I, I don't want to talk about you know even the government is kind of you know uh, uh, very uh, troubled by this issue. and i'm sure so are the telecom companies and you guys are also trying to answer a very relevant topic of spam protection yes. right and we are we are also building our own spam protection model which is very will be very soon available on airtel thanks app for our customers yeah. uh how do we detect spam and how do we block those uh turkey calls right 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 and mao again the same thing about uh, ethical use of ai uh how do you look into this um you know i'm in a little better position than anand uh, i'm not envy of him um but we are a b2b technology company yes when you when you talking about and he's a service provider in a b2c context and yes. and so when you talk about ethical use uh, the the issue here is that it can be looked at in three or four different parts one is the technology that is being uh, you know offering the services has to have the ability to uh, block or protect the end user and his data but you know you know like you said whether it is ethical or unethical is a subject of context and a very fine line yeah and the the aspect of addressing this is threefold the tech has to support it the processes that are built around it like how you do a kyc what documents you collect and all that has to be well defined and how is this data protected in terms of data protection processes who has access who can read who can write who can modify all that definition has to come in well now the first part of the tech side we are doing like i told you that protecting financial data we are using um, blockchain but a lot also has to be done in terms of the process and in terms of uh, you know individual consumer data Uh, uh the authorization of the rights uh, has to be uh, organized at a at a service provider level which uh, i said i'm not envy of anand right and uh, dr singh like uh, 
Mao said that students are, uh, you know, generally very much aware of what's happening around horizontally. They are good, but uh, you know, and they are always re- ready for experimentation, understanding new technologies and all. Uh, in your teaching, when you in your classes, how do you incorporate this spirit of, you know, uh, of also understanding that ethical uh, practices have to be followed, ethics have to be followed, and the right bit of honesty has to be followed because you know. Technology can go either ways, and you know these guys are learning. You know, it's uh, you know absorbing so much, and they want to experiment so much that you know they may be swayed by this kind of thoughts of you know getting into you know uh, different kind of things which are not legal sometimes. How do you uh, teach them about these uh, values of ethics and integrity? Very, very, very interesting question, Pankaj, and thanks for raising this because see, uh, they are. There are two aspects I'll touch here, and uh, one aspect. So, uh, being a manufacturing guy, we call it. There is a concept called end of pipe, and there is a concept called at the start of the pipe. So, uh, when you when you say end of the pipe, for example, in our case as a university, a university has an ethical committee, and by default, the vice chancellor is the chairman. Now, since a university like us, we have a huge medicine school, coupled along with a hospital. so there are school level ethical committees as well now mm. why this committees uh, i am giving a very interesting perspective yes ait publishes more than 200 artifacts every year it could be any university it could be in the form of uh, research articles in some of the peer reviewed very high peer reviewed abc kind of journals q1 q2 q3 kind of stuff or a lot of books or monograms copyrights patents which we have been we have been publishing and every university does that and this yeah. is a part of the way of the life of any big time interdisciplinary university like us now when these data and when this information in the form of these artifacts when they go outside and get published on the international platforms it could be a big time publishing house yeah these all has to be screened and passed through ethical committees yeah and has to, and and the university has a business here to ensure that no such kind of fraudulent or other measures have gone into while this information or data has gone out i'll give you the reason why today you see apart from aict ugc or nri ranking which is like happening in india the universities like us which has gone for foreign rankings with abet or iit and so on and so on lot of this ranking done by qs or times in that sense times uh, higher education ranking as well lot of data has been taken from open source platforms now suppose i as a researcher has sent one artifact which has got rejected in an open source then it remains there and i have my affiliation as a kit university been mentioned so when this ai tool based platforms will pick up the data and basis that if they will try to do some kind of rankings then this all will get reflected and will bring my rankings down now in the, in that scenario uh, the 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 ethical committees has to play a big big role and last so my, my my question was more about you know driving these values within the students as well you know in the okay. minds of students so, that so, you, yeah. so back to again student side so these committees along with these senior people are supposed to be responsible to ensure that whatever students also have been publishing with them has to pass through screen it properly but the 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 overall framework of the course if you'll see we have yeah. a component and a subject on ethics and all those related areas where we teach our students and nep yeah. also talks about that and it is been done in the first semester or second semester itself in most of the courses that's a, that's it is a must but i don't know uh, uh, when you become like like a professing professional when you are part of some societies you go through a pledge and then you undergo that pledge and you get a license to profess your profession in india the engineers it is still not happening so uh, I, i mean if i is is like a medical practice there so if i do something ethically wrong i will be stripped of my doing a practice which is a professional practice but it is very much in the western world some or other way it will come down and percolate to intern system also especially the technology side and those areas where you actually need to go and that's do really, that's a very good suggestion uh i'll also take you uh, to this conference that was uh, held recently in delhi about the global partnership on ai where prime minister modi was there 
and <clears throat> even the prime minister uh, spoke about the need to regulate ai generative ai and he also spoke about you know creating a global frame, framework because you know uh, these these changes are happening across the world and not only in one particular country uh, uh, if i come to <clears throat> you mao how do you see this scenario of regulation you know sometimes there is this fear that uh, it, more regulation actually stifles innovation uh do you think that regulation is required how much of regulation is required and uh, how do you see this whole uh, you know conversation around regulating ai um i know uh, regulation is restrictive uh, can stifle innovation that you talk about but the abuse of ai can be so severe that we can't close our eyes to it i mean there are a lot of articles you read on fraud where your you know voice is recorded or or taken and oh, in, yes. in in a different context it ai yeah, it is created and a conversation is played to a, a gullible investor or a, or a consumer yeah. yeah so yeah. so there is a need for uh, protecting and hence regulation i think two or three days back the telecom new telecom policy that got released on the basis yeah. of it is now a law yeah uh so so it has to be enforced uh so some cases it is required and my personal view is it is required right right and then what what are your views on this no i totally agree because um with the technology will come the abuses as well right yeah. and there has to be a deterrent yeah uh, how successful will that deterrent be will depend on are there counter compensating measures being developed as well yeah the technology is there if it is smarter than the regulation there will be very difficult to catch but the regulation only acts as a deterrent there has to be counter compensating measures to detect fakes or detect frauds right. again that the use of technology will come into play, play here yeah also exactly. the enforcement also the enforcement to the enforcement yes no i think things like you know a, uh, you know deep fakes and all you know they are becoming such a big menace right now and uh, not only governments but you know uh, everybody in the industry is also pretty worried about this dr singh uh, do you also uh, tell students about you know the kind of you know uh, potential uh, concern areas uh, which are related to ai for example as we spoke about deep fakes your intellectual property rights or you know those kind of things are also uh, absolutely critical and anybody who's dealing in those areas should also know about this even if it's a student of course of course uh, very rightly said pankaj uh, see we as a university also have a school of law here and interestingly we have been running three integrated courses so one course is bsc llb as well fortunately unfortunately we have seen a pan india phenomena we don't attract much talent coming to bsc llb now when i say bsc llb in what is the component of science which has been taught there earlier it used to be more related with biotechnology because there those uh, compliances and those regulations and those things come into picture now it is yeah. more it cyber security blockchains and cryptos also which is coming into picture so we recently tied up with an organization coalition school of cyber laws which is a pune based organization they are working with few national law schools and one yeah. of the and few of the universities in maharashtra and yeah. we have been trying to bring that perspective in the form of a curriculum which is an open elective across all the 200 plus courses which we are running i am we are asking our students to undergo that course and that course again when i used to talk to those subject matter experts they used to say that the regulations and the laws are still in a process where they are getting framed up and it is always a war i mean i mean the regulations coming in and then new tech coming in where some fraud happens now for example they said we don't have any percolated laws for anything which happens in crypto site in india you got it so 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 but then this always has to be taught to our students we have instruments in place and we call it open elective where through the cyber laws has been taught and we are also asking students that probably if we can churn out more engineering plus law bsc plus law biotech plus law kind of and graduates coming in from universities they may come up with more such kind of uh, 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 perspectives and can be a think tank in the future who can come up with those kind of regulations right 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 but that domain has to come in from there if you are there doing if there are law professionals 
right so uh, pretty interesting discussion we are almost reaching the end of the discussion and since a lot of students would be you know kind of would be interested in this kind of uh, conversation just wanted to understand from you guys that you know <clears throat> what advice would you give to students you know a lot of engineering students uh maybe listening to this uh, do they need to come work only towards ai ml is this the only future uh, if they are thinking of that what should they you know what kind of thing uh, should they keep in mind uh, and there could be non technical uh, non ai ml students also who may be listening to this so what is the future for them uh, amao if i start with you i i think ai ml is an application it's not a fundamental core skill so the students who want to i mean they can't stay away or or alienate themselves from ai in life no matter what yeah. they do as i said agri healthcare edutech yeah banking financial telecom doesn't really matter so yeah. the first first thing that is required is strong analytical skills yeah strong mathematical mo- modeling and background yeah uh, that would be necessary uh, on a going forward Uh, those who want to be on the programming python r and they you know every 5 years there is a new language doesn't really matter but you should have a flair for learning new programming languages in that context right then then data science is a huge ocean um whether it is data visualization data communication data analytics uh, handling large chunk of data through apache hadoop or or any other technology that allows you to deal with such large chunks of data at a, at a much faster pace and then uh, the communication visualization that i was talking about in terms of how do you derive meaningful insight out of the data and how do you communicate that data in in a way that a common man can appreciate it and finally the domain that you want to apply all this into Uh, you have to have one in that t model one vertical bar at least for you to learn how to do it so i i would say that take interest in this fundamentals it will position you much better for ai ml nobody came uh, trained m m i l ai ml from their early uh, days i mean i didn't know what ai ml is till 5 years back so i think it is how strong you are in your fundamental takes you uh, to the right places absolutely anant uh, what are your views on this see my views are little yeah so more or less in the line they are saying there are only two types of people in future either they will be using ai or they will be building ai right and therefore in, in terms of for students right it's important to consider ai as an intelligent assistant to them on how they can improve the things that they are supposed to do so for example their core subjects right it's important to understand the core subjects it's not either or because without that you will not know how to either use ai or build ai right and like mao said ai would be in everything that we do right even for not engineers it is there for them to learn and there will be areas where you would be able to learn ai it need not be really technical in that sense right and those who are in the engineering stream right sooner or later they will be either building ai or using ai to do their job yeah and it can be learned but the basics of the of the subject that you have today has to be mastered to be able to do that okay coding that core, is equally, core is equally important core is equally important and dr singh uh, last Lastly, to you, uh, how, what do you tell students when they come to you for advice on you know all these changes happening around? See, my take, and that's what we have been doing is, uh, as I always say, and probably uh, Mr. Mao and Mr. Anand both who comes from corporate background will agree that if I mean if I have to put my, put myself into the shoes of a corporate, I have to look into a fresh talent coming in. So, what is that exactly? I'm looking into. on the proportion of two areas which is on the soft skill side and on the domain side so i'll i'll suggest students right now that because you asked that what message we have to give to the students see the soft skill side the attitudinal side and mao mentioned in uh, just now the critical thinking the ability to connect those dots and solve those business problems is very very important now yeah. the curriculum everything happening either inside the class or outside the class or whatever they have been leading their day in day out life 
they have to have be be a part of this process of uh, uh, thinking critically, connecting those dots, and if they want a corporate career, then bringing those revenues into the corporate actually when they actually go and solve those problems. Now, 90-90% will be this. So soft skills, the communications, the right kind of attitude and aptitude is what students should actually invest on themselves. Rest apart, the domain or the niche skills or certain skills, anyways, the university or the organization which is going to hire and the kind of work which they are going to get from them, they will polish them. And as what Mao said, maybe the technology will change, the new languages will come in. This all will happen. So maybe I'm working after five years, I have to again master something new because every day and day out there is new thing which is coming in. So that is something which is like a RAM or kind of a, a, a RAM and this is something which is a kind of a read of read only memory kind of stuff <laughs> where they have to build this fundamentals very strong in it. The geotechnical thing has to be inside the ground has to be quite strong so that these verticals can be built again and again. Reskilling, scaling, reskilling, scaling can happen. Because if you see any report today, this new gen which is coming in, I mean, they will bound to have three to four careers in their life. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, they, they, it, is, it is absolutely established now. So, so they, they have to be agile in that sense uh, as far as the learning is concerned. But that can happen only when fundamentals are correct, what Ananta said. And institution will take care of those aspects. No, thank you very much, gentlemen, for all these fantastic views. I think we are witnessing a generational change in terms of technology. And as Anant rightly said, either you'll be using AI, either you'll be building AI, but you can, cannot ignore AI at all. Uh, AI is nothing but a more efficient way of living. It may have an impact on jobs, maybe temporarily. But, you know, as, we, as, as we've seen previous evolutions as well, you know, it helps create uh, more efficiency than maybe a very newer set of jobs that may come in the future. Uh, the need of the R is also to maintain ethical practices, to maintain data privacy, while the governments across the world uh, work on new regulations to make it a more coherent and a more ethical kind of setup that we have. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you from uh, the, this series of Bright Mind uh, by Times of India and Comviva. And in the next uh, discussion, we'll have more topics to discuss. Thank you all very much for joining us here. Thank you. Thank you, Pankaj. Thanks, thank you. Pankaj. Thanks, Anand. Thank That's you, Professor. I'll be seeing you soon, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Mao uh, Sarvil Kachapsar.